right. Welcome everyone uh, to uh, the talk today. It's a real pleasure to be here in person and to see your faces and have this um, delicious food. Um, it's a, a huge ple pleasure for me to introduce Tony Schaefer, who's a professor of African and French studies at the University of Portsmouth in the UK. Um, Tony's trained as an historian and received his PhD from the University of London. Um, I came across his work several years ago when his post-tenure I began a new project on Franco-African relations in the post-colonial period. Um, and I discovered uh, his um, really quite fascinating book-length account of decolonization in West Africa, um, which he intriguingly, I think, persuasively describes as an accidentally successful decolonization. Um, in that book, uh, The End of Empire in French West Africa has recently been updated and republished in French. Um, Tony has written uh, extensively on um, not just decolonization, but also post-independence Franco-African relations, um, particularly focusing on the ongoing and complex mutual interdependence between France and her former colonies. And his current work focuses on um, French military and security policy in Africa. Um, Tony was all set to visit us in person. Um, he was a day away from his flight and unfortunately um, came down with a positive COVID test. Um, it was not able to come. Uh, he is happily in good health and was willing to um, be our guinea pig for what I think is the first hybrid um, session of the African Noon series. And so, Tony, please be forgiving for us. We are learning how this hybrid thing works on our end. Um, I don't think there should be any, um, any hiccups, but you never know. Okay. Um, so, Tony is going to, for roughly, we'll have time for discussion and questions um, as they arise. And I think we have practice. This is the end at one o'clock, is that right? Okay, wonderful. Thank you. Thank you, Tony. Thank you very much, Jason, for that uh, very generous introduction. And it's a great pleasure to be with you. I'm just sorry, as uh, Jason said, that I can't be with you uh, in person. I fell foul of the um, pre-flight COVID test. So I'm going to uh, share my screen with you. Hopefully you can, uh, hopefully you can see that. Yep. And in a moment, I will uh, go to the, I'm just waiting for the, um, the band at the top to disappear, and then I shall be able to uh, go to full screen. Oh, there you go. Yeah. There we are. Okay. So my title today is French Military Interventions in the Sahel. Two cheers for multilateralism. Now, successive French presidents have promised to put France's relations with Africa onto a more normal footing to put an end to la France Afrique and the neo-colonial practices that underpin it and to build a new partnership with Africa. Right back to President Mitterrand in 1981 and then later President Sarkozy, Hollande and Macron have all made promises to renew the Franco-African relationship. But yet these promises remain unfulfilled. It seems that old habits die hard. In a single lecture, I don't have time to survey all the different dimensions of France's special relationship with Africa, the so-called France Afrique, and how it has changed or not changed. In this talk, I shall therefore focus on one particular aspect of this relationship, the military dimension. What lies beneath what Nathaniel Powell has called the recurring logic of French military interventions in Africa? How can we explain the fact that despite repeated promises that France will no longer act as the gendarme of Africa, it has continued to intervene militarily on the continent, on average at least once a year, since political independence? The starting point for this paper is thus the question of the newness or otherwise 
of France's recent interventions in the Western Sahel? I suggest this question can only be answered by looking at the history of French military interventions over the long durée, over the long term. Now I will do this using a historical institutionalist lens. Historical institutionalism is valuable as an analytical lens as it's concerned with tracing processes through time, analyzing institutional configurations and contexts, and is adept at embedding new or seemingly new policy directions in a long-term perspective. Using a historical institutionalist framework helps to show how the melding of the old and the new is possible, thanks to the persistence of certain practices and the presence of certain latent ideas that have long existed within French military thinking. I'm going to use three key concepts from historical institutionalism. Firstly, path dependency, which refers to the tendency for policies and practices to develop their own self-reinforcing logic, following on from an initial choice, decision or event. The process is reinforcing because it's subject to increasing returns, that is, the returns from engaging in a certain behaviour or from adopting a certain rule increase over time and make the adoption of alternatives less attractive. Secondly, layering. This refers to the ways in which new ways of doing and thinking, or apparently new ways of doing and thinking, are introduced alongside or superimposed on top of existing ones. And then thirdly, drift. This refers to a process by which existing rules, norms and practices are reinterpreted or applied in new ways so that the rule or norm no longer has the same impact. What each of these two modes of institutional change, layering and drift, have in common is that they build on existing rules, norms and practices, which are not radically altered, but either complemented, layering, or reinterpreted, drift. Now, my focus in this paper is on path dependency in French African military policy. I won't discuss the role of African elites here as it's not central to the argument I'll be making today. But it is important to recognize that Francophone African elites play a key role in feeding into and reinforcing the path dependency that I will be discussing. To take just one example, a key factor in changing President Hollande's mind about intervening militarily in Mali in 2013 having promised repeatedly not to do so, was phone calls from the presidents of Senegal and Niger, who feared the impact of instability in their neighbour Mali and urged France to intervene. Thus, what is perceived by Francophone African leaders as the French security guarantee has given African leaders a major role in influencing French military policy. The French desire to maintain the credibility of its security guarantee and to remain a pivotal actor in the security arena has reinforced this dynamic. This in turn has made French policymakers vulnerable to the demands of African elites eager to exploit the French security guarantee for their own benefit. And it has made it much more difficult for France to break away from the perception of it as the gendarme of Africa. My focus today is on understanding developments in French policy, but it's important not to lose sight of the role African elites play in shaping that policy. Throughout the Cold War years then, from political independence until 1994, French military policy in Africa was characterized by unilateralism. This was possible thanks to France's pre-positioned troops based in Africa, its readiness to intervene, there were some 30 or so French military interventions in Africa over the three decades after political independence, and the bilateral military and defence agreements signed with former French colonies in Africa after, after independence that provided the legal basis for intervention. This activism established France's reputation as the gendarme of Africa, in what became known as its Pecahé, its backyard. The recourse to unilateral action was accompanied by the practice of self-legitimation, 
In other words, interventions were conducted according to French interpretations of security to defend imperiled African heads of state at the discretion of the French president against any threat to the regime. Rules of engagement and levels of force deployed were determined by France without reference to external authorities. Finally, unilateralism was associated with the practice of substitution for Francophone African armies by the French military. Military technical assistance were deployed throughout Francophone Africa. French officers were integrated into African armies and often played a highly directive role vis-a-vis -vis African armies in any conflict. French troops were sent out to resolve conflicts without the help of the military of the host country and French military equipment was supplied. The end of the Cold War marked a seismic shift in the international system. However, while this clearly pointed to the need for a strategic reassessment of the French approach to Africa, it wasn't immediately apparent what should now happen, especially as France had been allowed largely free reign so long as it maintained stability and kept the Soviet Union out of Africa. Then came the crisis in Rwanda. France was the key international supporter of the Habyarimana regime that was responsible for the 1994 genocide, as French troops provided advice, training and arms to the Rwandan army. Following the genocide, the French government secured UN authorization in June 1994 for Operation Turquoise, which was presented as a multilateral humanitarian mission, although many critics believed this was less about saving lives than providing Hutus who had been involved in the genocide with an escape route into eastern Zaire. France's involvement in Rwanda in the run-up to and immediate aftermath of the genocide provoked widespread domestic and international criticism and accusations of French neo-colonialism. Senior military officials in interviews with me subsequently described how Rwanda was experienced politically and militarily as a traumatic moment by the French military. It follows that the Rwandan genocide became the tipping point the moment when the continuation of France's traditional military policies towards Africa became untenable. Now, it's important to emphasize at this point, I'm not arguing that the Rwandan moment completely transformed France's military policy. Rather, it engendered a new path dependent approach centered on multilateralism. It led to new practices that were consistent with this path the recognition of the need to respect mandates and rules of engagement as prescribed by international, usually UN Security Council, mandates, and the move away from substitution for African forces towards capacity building and training African troops for peacekeeping. But as I will argue, it was several years before this new multilateral approach became embedded in French military policy. And even then, the old unilateral impulses periodically resurface, as I will show. So what happened after 1994? To begin with, there was a shift away from self-legitimation and an acceptance that French interventions needed to be mandated by international bodies such as the UN Security Council, ideally also with approval from regional bodies such as the EU and or the AU. An early sign of this new approach was the first EU military mission in Africa, Operation Artemis in the DRC in 2003. France was the lead nation, but EU member states, notably the UK, were involved in assessing the situation as well as fixing the scope of the operation. It was to be a humanitarian mission, time limited, with strict rules of engagement and UN Security Council approval. However, as the European Commission's own report after the event stated, Artemis was more a French operation with an EU cover than an EU operation led by the French. There was also a shift away from substitution for African forces towards building the capacity of African forces for peacekeeping and peace support operations. 
The trend towards multilateralism soon ran into problems, however, in the face of an emerging crisis in Côte d'Ivoire. In an early example of drift away from the multilateral approach, French governments went against or ignored central tenets of the new multilateral approach by undertaking unilateral actions on several occasions. Thus, France intervened unilaterally in 2002 with its operation Licorne to prevent northern rebels taking the capital, Abidjan. This resulted in the country being effectively divided in two, with French forces deploying across the centre of the country to separate the northern rebels from government troops in the south. Subsequently, France sought to multilateralize its approach by involving ECOWAS, the Economic Community of West African States, which sent a military force to operate alongside the 4,000 strong French forces of Operation Licorne. France then obtained UN Security Council approval for a resolution in 2004, authorizing the deployment of a UN military mission, UNOSI, to take over from ECOWAS forces in support of Operation Licorne. However, efforts to implement practices that were consistent with the new multilateral approach, working with ECOWAS, gaining the support of the UN Security Council, continued to be accompanied by old style unilateral reflexes. For example, when France called the warring parties to Paris for a peace conference in 2003, and then when President Chirac ordered the destruction of the entire Ivoirian Air Force in November 2004, following an Ivoirian attack on a French military base that killed nine French soldiers. These, I contend, are examples of layer layering. At the same time, there was evidence of drift when old ideas, such as the notion that France had a special responsibility for ensuring African security, were stretched conceptually so as to fit within a UN peacekeeping and mediation framework. In parallel with what was happening in Côte d'Ivoire, President Chirac stepped up efforts to multilateralize French missions by involving the EU in France's peace and security actions in Africa in an effort to share the costs and risks, both financial and political, of that commitment. His successor, President Sarkozy, intensified these efforts. As a result, under their presidencies, there were three French-inspired EU military missions that deployed EU troops into Africa. Operation Artemis, which I've already mentioned, followed by U4DRC, and then U4 Chad Central African Republic in 2008-2009. However, this latter was to be the last EU mission on African soil involving the deployment of European combat troops. Having been persuaded to participate in these French-led military operations, EU member states, notably Germany, became sceptical about the value of such interventions in African crises and wary of France implicating them in its African problems. As a result, one key strand of France's initial multilateralization strategy, the deployment of EU combat troops to intervene in African crises, proved short-lived. This led France to rethink its multilateral approach and to seek to involve the EU in its African security policy in different ways, as we will see shortly. Overall, the Côte d'Ivoire case demonstrates how the multilateral approach provided a permissive environment, which left space for older forms of unilateralism to reassert themselves. And this pattern re-emerged after 2013 with the launch of operations Serval and Barkhane. And it is to these that I now turn. France's operations in the Western Sahel provide further evidence of how the new multilateralism has been subject to layering and drift. I will argue here that Operation Serval, which in 2013 deployed 4,000 French and more than 2,000 Chadian troops to Mali against a northern Tuareg and Islamist offensive that threatened to advance on the capital Bamako, and Operation Barkhane, a regional counter-terrorism operation 
launched in 2014 in cooperation with the G5 Sahel countries, Burkina Faso, Chad, Mali, Mauritania and Niger. Further build upon, but also drift away from the new path dependent trajectory of multilateralism that emerged after the Rwanda genocide. There are two key arguments that I want to make here. First, operations Serval and Bakan are in many respects consistent with the multilateral approach adopted since the mid 1990s. But secondly, that incremental changes within the core post-1994 path dependency have resulted through layering and drift in a hybridization of France's multilateral approach. As part of this hybridization process, these operations, and especially Bakan, have incorporated features that evoke practices and ideas that predate the genocide. In terms of legitimation and rules of engagement, French military policy in the Western Sahel confirms France's acceptance that it can no longer operate simply according to its own assessments and criteria if its actions are to be recognized as legitimate. President Hollande, having pledged not to put French troops on the ground in Mali, ultimately did so in January 2013. In doing so, he stressed the normative dimension shared interests in the fight against terrorism and protecting Malian sovereignty. His administration framed the intervention carefully and adopted a range of procedures required by its commitment to multilateralism in order to win support from the AU, the EU and the UN before the launch of Operation Serval. The emphasis on shared international interests and threats was a crucial factor in the mission building process, allaying suspicions about France's past practices and increasing the chances of buy-in from the UN, the AU and the EU. The EU was also brought on board by France raising the spectre of terrorism and immigration as threats to European security. French fame, frame, the French framing of its intervention in this way and its constant lobbying led the EU to mount supporting missions, the EU training mission to retrain the Malian army, the EUTM, and the European capacity building mission focusing on security sector reform, the UCAP Sahel Mali. The old French unilateralism and its accompanying practices have thus given way to a French emphasis on operating via a multilateral framework as lead nation in the fight against terrorism. Self-legitimation has been replaced by a normative reframing of intervention. And France has recast the French practice of African policing, France as the gendarme of Africa, as a stabilizing mission for peace and security. At the same time, however, there is evidence of layering and drift. Prior to the launch of Operation Serval and reminiscent of previous practices, France secured, albeit in questionable circumstances, the letter from the interim Malian president requesting France's intervention. French officials reportedly wrote the letter. Also, while the French authorities contend that African forces are being trained to undertake operations to counter terrorist threats, in practice, most counter terrorist actions have been carried out by French forces. Indeed, with Operation Barkhane, it can be argued that multilateralism has drifted into something more akin to ad hoc coalition building. By actively promoting the G5 Sahel Joint Force as a regional partner to combat the threat of terrorist organizations operating in the region, France has played a central role in the de facto coalition building of a regional counter-terrorist force, which subsequently received the backing of the African Union and the UN Security Council. It has also shifted the parameters for security cooperation laying the basis for a regional response of a new type to the security and terrorist threats facing the region, and in the process bypassing existing regional organizations such as ECOWAS. This represents a drift away from a country to a region-based partnership. 
So what we have in the Western Sahel then is quite clearly a multilateral intervention or rather a series of interventions. There is complementarity between them, although each is under separate command and has its own separate mandate. This has re resulted in a de facto division of labor between them, with Barkhan focusing on kinetic counter-terrorist operations, while MINUSMA supports political processes and reconciliation, EUTM Mali and EUCAP Sahel Mali respectively retrain the Malian army and reform the country's security sector. Alongside these missions, Barkhane is most exclusively a French operation. At the same time, UN and EU mandates have proved ill-equipped to keep pace with the changing realities and growing challenges on the ground. This has led to drift in relation to the ways in which the international mandates have been interpreted. For example, Barkhane forces, which benefit from close cooperation with UN forces from MINUSMA, have been using the kind of techniques and warfare usually associated with counterinsurgency operations. At the same time, there has been a de degree of mandate drift at the UN, as the UN Security Council, with strong French backing, unanimously adopted a resolution in December 2017, authorizing UN peacekeepers deployed in Mali to provide the G5 Sahel joint force with logistic and operational support. In addition to these examples of drift, there are also examples of layering at the operational level. For example, forces from Operation Barkhane intervened in February 2019 in an old style unilateral military intervention at the request of Chad's then president Idris Deby to beat back rebels who were advancing on N'Djamena from the north. In summary, French military operations in the Western Sahel have been a laboratory of experimentation for France's new multilateral approach to military intervention in Africa. What has emerged is a hybrid approach that combines multilateralism with some of the reflexes, norms and practices associated with the old unilateral approach. Procedurally, interventions have not always received prior UN authorization. Moreover, France is very much the lead nation in the Western Sahel, thanks to its influential position within or in relation to the various bodies involved. It's a permanent member of the UN Security Council, a key player in the EU, particularly on African issues, and is politically close to many of the Francophone states of Western Central Africa, with which it has a long tradition of military cooperation. Moreover, power relations between France and the G5 Sahel grouping, which includes four of the poorest countries in the world, with armies that are acutely ill-equipped to confront the security challenges they face, um, these power relations are clearly asymmetric. So how does a historical institutionalist approach help us to understand the shift or perhaps the partial shift to a multilateral approach? There are two points I'd like to make here about how historical institutionalism helps us to understand the way in which France's hybrid intervention in the Sahel since 2013 has melded together elements of the new with elements of the old. Firstly, the change permitting nature of institutions, the focus here being on the proneness of institutions to conceptual stretching. And secondly, the power of latent ideas. To begin with the change permitting properties of institutions, that is of rules, practices and procedures, it should be clear that each of the elements of the new multilateral path dependence that has emerged following the Rwanda genocide could easily be subject to conceptual or norm stretching. Multilateral could in principle encompass anything that is not blatantly unilateral. Hence, multinational deployments of various sizes, types and configurations can qualify as multilateral. Equally, a new path dependent norm that requires adherence to internationally set criteria allows leeway to forum shop as regards the source of the mandate recognition or approval. Similarly, 
the mantra of African solutions to African problems is flexible in terms of what it means in practice. It's perfectly possible, for example, to argue that training African forces to undertake operations which France no longer wishes to lead and accompanying them on operations is in keeping with the idea of African solutions to African problems. With regard to France's core shift from unilateralism to multilateralism, the French armed forces have clearly played a central role in developing the new multilateral approach. This was driven by resource considerations. France had neither the money nor the troop numbers to maintain its old unilateral approach and undertake all the actions in Africa that it once could. So it needed to share the burden. There was also crucially a need to share the political risks of intervention following the widespread criticism of France's role in Rwanda and initially in Côte d'Ivoire. However, within this new multilateral path dependency, it was the French military that facilitated a shift away from a formalized multilateral approach rooted in the French military's traditional dislike of coalitions towards a form of multilateralism that eschews formal coalitions and enables France to take the lead role. Turning now to the power of latent ideas, these have facilitated layering and drift in France's Sahelian operations. The first is the idea of France as the guarantor of African stability, the gendarme of Africa. While initially France appointed itself to this role, it became widely accepted by international actors that when crises kicked off in countries that were part of its backyard, France would intervene. The idea that France should intervene or face a loss of credibility has informed all French presidents and poly policymakers' decision making under the Fifth Republic. Secondly, there is the concern over the domino effect, the idea that instability or collapse in one country could be contagious and lead to insecurity across a whole region. French policymakers since at least the 1980s have often considered intervention to be necessary to prevent such a scenario. We saw this, for example, with Operation Manta from 1983 to four and Operation Epervier from 1986 to 2014, where the aim was to prevent Libya destabilizing and ultimately taking over Chad. And we've seen it again with Operations Serval and Barkhane and French support for the G5 Sahel Joint Force, where the objective is to prevent violent armed groups from destabilizing the Western Sahel region. A further structuring idea is that of geographical proximity, which harks back to the old French colonial idea of Eurafrica. The point here is that by constantly emphasizing how close the Sahel is to the Mediterranean, the French government seeks to underline that the crisis in the Sahel represents a threat to European, not just African, security. And finally, there is the idea of the French exception, of France playing a distinctive role in any intervention. And linked to this, the notion of operational autonomy. Even as France has moved away from unilateral intervention towards intervening in a multilateral context with support from other partners and authorization from the reg relevant regional body and or the UN, it has continued to operate independently alongside other interveners. In Côte d'Ivoire, Operation Licorne remained under separate French command, operating alongside ECOWAS and subsequently UN forces. This has also been the case in Mali and the Western Sahel, where French forces have remained under French command and have operated autonomously. They're not deployed to the UN force, MINUSMA, and are not involved in the EU training mission, although they do have French political and military advisors embedded within it. In the context of this paper, therefore, historical institutionalism has added value to our understanding of France's interventions in the Sahel by shedding light on the institutional underpinnings of continuity and change in French military policy in Africa. It has provided insights into the way that foreign policy, in this case, French African military policy, can follow a path dependent, self-reinforcing logic 
that makes changing tack difficult. Thus, while France has hit on, while France has hit upon a promising formula for mobilizing and leading military missions in Africa, this does not mean that it has been tackling the root causes of the security problem. Thank you very much. Bring your laptop. You can use. Uh... Yes, you'll be able to see questions and. Tony, we're going to move into a um, about fifteen minutes of, of Q and A from members of the audience here in person. They're also on on chat. Harry's going to help me to um, deal with this. I think on the tech side, on the chat side. Is that right, Harry? Sure. Yeah. yeah. Kids say I'm a dinosaur. Uh, very technologically speaking. Okay. Okay. Yep, so I, I see the chat. So if anyone wants to, I, I have questions, but I would like to. Yes, sir. The recent French military operation in Africa, did they still deploy the Jean Picot Yeah. Yeah. We had a question about the Legion Étrangère. The mm -hmm. foreign legion, whether they are involved in these African operations, you may or may not know anything about that. Um, yes, indeed, they are the um, the the main elements of the French army that are involved in Africa are what are called the uh, Troupe de la Marine, which is the actually goes right back to the colonial period, um, and the foreign legion. Uh, they are the main elements. Can I ask you to, I, I don't know if you're prepared to go outside of the Sahel, but um, one of the interesting situations that I've um, been following a bit is in the Central African Republic. Um, I guess my, my question is, you know, what is, what happens when France stops intervening? Um, who, if anyone, steps in um, to take its place? Um, and so in the Central African Republic, you obviously have sort of shockingly, um, increasingly um, Russian um, involvement either for proxies or directly. And so I guess I'm, I'm wondering if you can explain how that situation fits into France's continuing involvement in other areas of Africa. Did somebody just repeat the question for me? I didn't catch all of that. Oh, wait, I was trying to. Okay. So I, I, let me start over and try to, oh my gosh, we have tech problems. I think you have to mute that one. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> There we go. Okay, I'll try again. Harry? Tony, I'm sorry. Is this better? Yeah, that's fine. Okay, I guess, I, and so I, my, my question was basically sort of the uh, sort of a counterfactual, which is like, what happens when France decides not to intervene as much as it used to? And, and I was thinking of the Central African Republic, and this is sort of a security vacuum that ends up being, um, you know, perhaps occupied by other less desirable um, uh, uh, entities, um, like 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 Russian troops or their or their proxies. And so I, I you know, I guess um, I'd ask you to. Sort of maybe talk about sort of like what we would expect to find in interventions, and, and I don't mean that to justify French interventions, but I wonder um, what we might see without them. Yes, that's that's a very good question, and of course it's going to become uh, a very pertinent question in the case of Mali because um, France has announced recently the end of um, uh, Operation Barkhane. Um, although I don't actually believe that Operation Barkhan will completely end, I think it's going to be reconfigured probably into um, probably into Niger. Um, but, uh, but to come back to your question, um, the, the Malian government has also called, like the Central African Republic did, um, on Wagner, on the Russian uh, on the Russian mercenaries. Um, and uh, they seem to do this in, re in, in return for guaranteed access to 
um, uh, in, in the Central African Republic, it seemed to be to um, uh, minerals, uh, gold in particular, and this seems to be, although nobody's actually announced this, this seems to be the case in, uh, in Mali as well. Um, uh, so what happens when, um, when France doesn't intervene? Well, the problem is in the Central African Republic, um, nobody else um, wanted to intervene and the United Nations um, forces uh, were hopelessly under-resourced um, and not able to provide um, uh, not able to provide human security, not able to provide protection. Um, and my guess is um, that um, there's going to be question marks over whether or not the UN mission in Mali continues. Its mandate is up for renewal in June. And I think given the recent developments there, the two military coups and now um, Bakan um, being withdrawn from Mali, at least, although not from the region, uh, there will be pressure within the U United Nations for that, uh, that mission uh, to, be, to be drawn down as well. Um, so it, it doesn't really answer your question, but it's, it is an open question. It, it depends on whether uh, other, um, uh, other countries or other organizations are prepared to take up the baton. In, in the case of Central African Republic, that clearly wasn't the case, and there was no appetite to deploy further UN troops. Um, and one wonders what's going to happen in Mali now um, with, the, uh, um, with the upcoming renewal of the mandate of the UN MINUSMA force in June. Uh, you know, can you read the, I'm scared to turn this on, can you read the chat question? Um, we have a question in chat that Harry's going to read to you, I think. Um, All right, so it says, uh, oh, can you see it, Tony, on your end? Um, is this the one much has been said about French? Yes, that's the one. Trend of coups in West Africa. Yeah. Um, based on your research that touches on this subject, what are the strengths and limitations of seeing these coups emanating from French intervention? Um, I'm, I'm somewhat skeptical about seeing these coups as being directly a product of um, French training. Um, I mean, in Mali, certainly until uh, 2012, when the crisis broke out there, um, most of the training of the uh, Malian army had done by the, the US. Um, since 2013, it's mostly being done by the um, EU uh, training mission. Um, there's been a coup recently in Guinea, um, but to my knowledge, France hasn't been involved in training uh, the Guinean uh, army. Um, France has certainly had a role in Burkina Faso, which has also had a coup recently. Um, so I'm not, in, I'm not inclined to draw a direct causal link between um, French training and the recent trend of coups in West Africa. Um, I think if you pressed me on the issue, I would probably say that uh, COVID and the ensuing economic crisis in countries across West Africa has probably had much more of a direct, um, uh, is much more of a direct driver of these, um, uh, of these recent, uh, of these recent coups. Um, it's become it was already very difficult, but it's become even more difficult for um, governments in these very poor countries to deliver even basic services to their uh, to their populations. Um, and I would probably be inclined to link 
increased instability recently to um, uh, to a combination of um, economic causes um, and perhaps perhaps also more broadly growing skepticism in the region about the value of international intervention um, uh, because certainly recently there's been uh, considerable uh, anti not just anti-French but anti-international forces anti-UN uh, demonstrations um, in Mali, Niger, and uh, Burkina Faso. Um, so, yeah, so I'm not sure that I would see French training as, a, uh, as, as directly linked uh, to the coups. I think there are other things going on. Yes. Um, <clears throat> Sorry, I come here. Hi, Tony. I'll, I'll come over here so you can hear my question. I wonder if you could comment a bit on how the the trans-Mediterranean migration that's been happening, human migration in the past five, 10 years, has influenced um, French military policy and this, and this sort of push for multilateralism. Has that, <laughs> has that immigration wave um, played any role? Um, yes and no. I think, um, uh, I mean, it's quite interesting reading, reading the, um, uh, CONOPS, the con concept of operations of the G5 Sahel Joint Force. Um, there are three elements to the CONOPS. One is counterterrorism. Two is countering international crime. And the third one is um, uh, dealing with the flows of illegal immigration, uh, dealing with migration flows. Um, now, that third aspect of the CONOPS has got absolutely nothing to do with um, issues that the G5 Sahel is concerned about. Um, not least because three of the members of the G5 Sahel are ECOWAS countries and they have freedom of movement with, between ECOWAS countries. So the migration part of the mandate has clearly been included in the G5 CONOPS um, in response to donor pressure and particularly in response to, uh, to French pressure. Um, so I think to that extent, um, the, um, the migration issue, which is increasingly presented as a uh, security um, issue for Europe, um, is linked to, um, to what is going on in the Western Sahel. And it's interesting, I was saying in the talk that um, that um, France has made efforts to present what's happening in the Western Sahel as a European security issue, not just an African security issue. Um, and that seems to have played a key role in bringing back on board countries like Germany, um, but not just Germany, um, uh, about because of concerns about the um, migration crisis on the southern shores of the Mediterranean. And as you were saying, it, it um, uh, attempts to, uh, attempts by immigrants to, to cross the, uh, uh, to cross the Mediterranean. So, so it's definitely, it's definitely part of the, part of the mix in terms of um, uh, how the, um, uh, interventions in the Western Sahel are now um, legitimized, if you like. Hi. Um, so I find um, your um, historical institutionalism very interesting. And um, from your talk, we were able to see what we gain by making use of historical institutionalism in this kind of analysis. But I also want to ask, like, what do we tend to lose when we make use of this type of, um, of historical institutionalism, especially when we focus on institutions to think about how nations relate to another, another nation on the global stage or um, the reasons for military intervention in other states? Um, from your own perspective, do you think there are things that we lose by focusing just on institutions rather than other agents within the state? And how do we navigate such 
issues when they come up in our work. Thank you. Yes, thank you very much. That's a, that's a very good question. And um, I would never pretend that um, historical institutionalism provides an, uh, an all round complete answer to understanding what uh, to understanding what's going on. Um, uh, as I said, towards the beginning of the talk, I think um, one of the things that you one of the key things that you lose if you're looking at if you're using historical institutionalism in the way that I do here with um, in, in an effort to throw light on continuities and change in French military policy in Africa. One of the things that one of the key things you lose is African agency. Afri African elites really since the 1970s have played a key role in shaping French military uh, policy in Africa. Um, by basically calling in France's, France's security guarantee. Um, uh, so so I, I, what I would say is that if you're using historical institutionalism provides a useful additional dimension, but it can't be used on its own to understand what's going on. Great, I think we have time for one last question from the... Um, online audience. You can see it on there. Can you see it's in this? Um, from Marissa Mormon asks, um, could you elaborate on the use of counterinsurgency strategies in these multilateral interventions? Um, elaborate on counterinsurgency strategies in multilateral operations. Um, yes, I mean, that's. Uh, um, that's As multilateralism changed, and so we, we, we find certain things objectionable about maybe French interventions and their methods, does making them multilateral actually change anything on the ground, do you think, from what we would have seen in a classic unilateral situation? Or is it just a fig leaf, as you're talking about <laughs> suggested? Um, well, I think, it, I, I think it is more than a fig leaf, because I think it, I think, um, France has had to move towards a more multilateral uh, approach. Um, so I don't think from that respect, it's a fig leaf. And I think that since the problems it confronted in Rwanda and um, Côte d'Ivoire, it's, uh, as I indicated in the, in the talk, it's been kind of trying to find a new approach um, in the Western Sahel that enables it to um, maintain its geopolitical interests there. Um, uh, and, and so I think what's, what's happened, I think it's happened kind of incrementally. I think France has had to um, adapt the way it works and what it's found what it's what it's now effectively hit upon is a um, is an is a situation where there's a, a number of different security actors operating in the western sahel some people refer to it some commentators refer to it as a security traffic jam but france is very much the pivotal actor it's very much at the center of this assemblage of um, this assemblage of interveners, so um, so I so I, I suppose in direct answer to your question, I don't think it's just a fig leaf, but I do think that France, through um, uh, building these multinational, multilateral. Uh, coalitions, which is partly able to do because of its position within the EU, because of its position on as a permanent member of the UN Security Council. Um, I, I think it. I think it has enabled it to re-legitimize its military interventions uh, in that way. Um, specifically, on the case of counterinsurgency, um, I. <laughs> It's, 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 it's a difficult one. I mean, I, I think that um, quite often people make uh, references back to French counterinsurgency tactics uh, during the colonial period and particularly the Algerian war. Um, and 
uh, I did actually put that question to the commander of um, uh, Operation Barkhan, um, and, and and he ab absolutely refused to um, recognise that uh, that continuity. But I do think that the way in which France is operating, I do think that that tradition is very deeply rooted within uh, within French military uh, within French military doctrine, uh, and I do think that. Uh, uh, the sorts of techniques that France has been using with Operation uh, Serval and with Operation Barkhane do have uh, significant parallels with the kinds of strategies that um, France has used in the past for putting down colonial insurrections. Yeah, we want to end, I think, uh, on time at one and be respectful of, of, of your evening. It must be late in, in the UK. Um, and so um, can we all give Tony a round of applause and thank him for presenting. That's very kind. Thank you. We hope, we hope to see you in Madison next time. I very much hope so. It would be very nice to join you actually in the flesh rather than just on a screen. But uh, Thank you all for coming and thank you all for your questions. It's been a pleasure.